All right, our topic today is faith and reason. Another way to think about this is uh, our topic is religious epistemology. In other words, what is the basis of belief in God if belief in God is going to be rational or justified or intellectually respectable and responsible? We're going to come at this question through comparing and contrasting the views of three philosophers. One is Thomas Aquinas, a Roman Catholic from the 1200s, uh, Michael Scriven, a contemporary atheist, and Alvin Plantinga, a contemporary Protestant. Scriven is the only one who is in your readings. Uh, the other two, Aquinas and Plantinga, this is just new information I'm giving you. So the two big questions that we're tackling are these. First, do we need arguments in order to justify belief in God? A lot of people think that faith is just totally different than reason, and that faith in God doesn't need any argument or reason or evidence to support it. Well, Scriven says, yes, uh, you need to have an argument to believe in God if you want your beliefs to be justified. If you believe in God, but you have no argument to support that belief, you're irrational. You're intellectually irresponsible. Planning, on the other hand, says, no, you don't need an argument in order to have justified belief in God. Um, you're perfectly intellectually responsible if uh, you believe in God without an argument to support it. Now, this raises the further question, um, are there any good arguments for the existence of God? Scriven and Nagel, who you're also reading, are atheists, and they both say, no, there's not. Although I don't know that Scriven talks about this question in the reading that you had. Aquinas, on the other hand, says, yes, there are good arguments for the existence of God. Aquinas thought he had five of them. We're not actually going to look at Aquinas's arguments in this class. We're going to look at some other um, theistic proofs. Um, other that are slightly different than the ones that he gave, related but different. Okay, so let's start with Scriven's view. Scriven says that any justified belief, including belief in God, has got to be based on arguments. And those arguments are ultimately going to be drawn from our ordinary, observational, scientific view of the world. That's what's going to give us the premises uh, for for arguments which can justify belief in God. Now, to be clear, Scriven doesn't think that there are any good arguments from those premises to belief in God. He, he thinks there's no good grounds to believe in God, but he says, if you, if you are going to believe in God, that's what you would have to do. You would have to have an argument based on ordinary, observational, scientific premises um, that prove that God exists. Um, he asked this question, is faith in principle, incompatible with reason? And he says, no, they're, they're not. The normal meaning of faith is confidence or belief. He says, belief in general is, uh, is not incompatible with reason. In fact, beliefs are well-founded only if they are supported by reason or supported by evidence. That's the normal meaning of faith. So if we're just thinking of the normal meaning of words, then there's no reason to think that in principle, faith is incompatible with reason. However, he says, some people talk of faith in a different way, as if it was a special kind of belief, or as if it was an alternative to reason. So faith, uh, on this view, is believing without any good reasons. But that raises a further question, says Scriven. He says, you can use words any way you want, but if that's what you mean by faith, if it means believing with no reason, then here's the question that we have to answer. Why should we think that faith is a reliable method of forming beliefs? Uh, why, is, why, are we, why do we think that faith is anything different than just rolling dice? He says, if you want to show that faith is a reliable method of belief formation, you're going to be doing it by appealing to reason. He says any method of showing that belief is likely to be true is, by definition, a justification of that belief. It's an appeal to reason. So as soon as you start trying to show that faith is reliable, you're giving reasons. And in that case, you've, you've ditched the claim that faith is belief without reason. So here are our choices. Either we have no reason to think that faith is reliable, or else, faith has got to be supported by evidence or reason. Um, now, 
Scriven uh, makes several further arguments against the sort of religionist who would say that that faith is uh, justified belief without reason. Okay, so the religionist might claim this: my belief in God is justified by my religious experience. So this is an appeal to religious experience as a basis for belief. Scriven says that well, religious experience may or may not be reliable. Let's say you have a vision of, of, of Jesus or a vision of the Virgin Mary or something like that. Um, now, maybe those are accurate and really the Virgin Mary or Jesus was appearing to you, but maybe it was a hallucination. We need to have some way of proving which it was. Now, the religionist may say many other people have had the same sort of religious experience. Scriven says, well, look, just because they all did doesn't mean that they're all right. They might have all had a delusive experience. They might all be hallucinating. Agreement doesn't guarantee reliability. You're going to need some kind of further proof than agreement. Furthermore, he says, you've got, you've got contradictory religions, conflicting religions that all appeal, appeal to the shared religious experiences of their adherents, and they can't all be right. So, you know, um, some people may have there may be a thousand or a million people who have had visions of the Virgin Mary, but there might be a thousand or a million people who have had visions of Krishna or Vishnu, and um, they can't both be right. I mean, uh, so so the mere fact that they're shared religious experience doesn't guarantee the truth of any of them. Now, Scriven wants to point out that there are big differences between widely shared religious beliefs and widely shared scientific beliefs. Now, here's his point in doing this. You might say, well, look, uh, you know, there's this many people who agree with my religious beliefs and experiences. And that's really gives just as much validation to my religious beliefs as the, the consensus of the scientific community. Right. They all agree with each other. We all agree. Uh, so really, we're all of our our beliefs are on the same footing. And Scriven says the agreement among scientists is totally different than the agreement among religious people. Uh, in the first place, religious belief, he says, concerns only a small number of entities like gods, the devil, angels, stuff like that. Scientific belief embraces billions of facts. Scientific belief covers all the objects of ordinary experience all the way out to the galaxies and stuff. Secondly, religious agreement is among a small part of the population about a limited kind of experience. Uh, the success and the reliability of science, on the other hand, is independently verified by everybody in virtually every aspect of their lives. So, you know, a million people may agree about their visions of the Virgin Mary, but all of us can verify independently that um, gravity pulls objects to the center of the earth. We don't need to be part of some culture or community to believe that. We can independently confirm that all the time. Three he says there's a lot more disagreement between religious believers than there is between scientists. You can think of all the different religious uh, faiths in the world and compare that to competing scientific theories. There's not nearly as many competing scientific theories as there are competing faiths. Fourth, he says, the religious agreement is due to enculturation. That is, people agree on religion because they're all raised in the same culture. Scientific agreement, he says, is due to independent testing and confirmation. You don't have to be in the same culture as me to independently arrive at the same scientific beliefs. And finally, every sane theist that should be sane. Every sane theist also agrees with the ordinary scientific beliefs, and they just add this extra layer on top. But not everybody who believes in ordinary scientific beliefs also believes in theism. So, says Scriven, the burden of proof is on the theist to show that this further step he wishes to take is not going to take him beyond the realm of truth. In other words, we need some reason to hold beliefs that go beyond the ordinary ones. And that's what the religionist has got to show us. So the burden of proof is on uh, the believer in God to give some kind of argument, some kind of evidence to show that faith is reliable, a reliable method of forming belief, that faith is likely to be true. You need an argument, says Scriven. 
Now, a totally different view of things is taken by Alvin Plantinga. Plantinga thinks that if God exists, then belief in God is properly basic. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, let's just think about the, the concept of being properly basic. He says some beliefs are properly basic, not just belief in God, but other beliefs too. Beliefs that are properly basic are justified even if we have no good argument to show they are true. Now, this is the kind of belief that Scriven is totally against. Well, he seems to be totally against it. Um, but Plantinga says that science itself has to be based on properly basic beliefs. And he says that belief in God can be a properly basic belief as well. Now, how's, Scriven, how's Plantinga going to respond to Scriven or arguments like his? Well, Scriven thinks that belief in God has to ultimately be based on our ordinary logic plus and everyday plus scientific knowledge. Well, what does everyday plus scientific knowledge include? It at least includes these two things. It includes, A, a belief in something like representative realism. That is, it includes the belief that our senses give us reliable knowledge of external objects. And second, it's going to include belief in the principle of uniformity, the idea that uh, the laws of nature always work the same way when we're looking and when we're not looking. But let's think about those two beliefs. According to Plantinga, there are no good arguments either for external objects that correspond to our sense perceptions or for the principle of uniformity. Now, in our epistemology unit, we looked at both kinds of beliefs like those, and we saw that, indeed, it's very difficult to come up with good arguments that prove representative realism. Or, And Hume says that there is no possible argument for the principle of uniformity. Plantinga agrees with that, but he says we shouldn't give up those beliefs. We're justified in believing in an external world and in the principle of uniformity. Those beliefs are properly basic. We don't need an argument to justify them. But now he adds this. If those beliefs can be properly basic, then so can belief in God. He says if God exists, it seems likely that he would make human beings in such a way that they're going to spontaneously, instinctively come to believe in him without the need of argument in the same way as we come to believe in the reality of external objects. In other words, uh, here's what he would say to Scriven. Scriven, you want us to base everything on science, but science itself is not is going to be based on these fundamental beliefs in the external world and in the laws of nature, which can't be proven. Now, Plantinga and Scriven both think that the scientific commitments are justified, but Plantinga thinks they're justified without argument. He says, if if science can be properly basic, then so can belief in God. Why not scribe it? So the burden of proof isn't on the theist uh, to, sh to give an argument for belief in God. It can be properly basic, instinctive, spontaneous, um, just like belief in external objects or the principle of uniformity. So here's the, the questions that Plantinga's position raises. Um, can belief in God be properly basic? Uh, is it on the same level as the principle of uniformity or belief in the external world where we can't give arguments to defend them, but we don't need them? Um, or is belief in God different than those other beliefs? Uh, which beliefs do you think are properly basic? Are, are we justified in believing just anything we want without argument? Sometimes it seems like we, we really need an argument. It would be irrational to believe without argument. Um, so not every belief can be properly basic, at least it seems that way. So what is the criteria? What, gets, what beliefs can be properly basic and which ones can't? That is a big question for you to think about.